mean, boy, I'll tell you something, man. So Angelo Cataldi was on with us earlier, and Seth Joyner just um, was on with us here for an hour and a half. And it was great stuff talking about the drama that's going on in Philly. And I'm going to start with our Hall of Fame voter, Jason Cole, with that now. And Jason, I mean, Derek Gunn, who I respect. And I'm wondering if you know who Derek Gunn is. I don't know Derek Gunn. Who is okay, he? He's been in the market for about 25 years. One of the more respected guys in the market. And I want to read you this. This is what he posted. And quite frankly, he's not like me, Jace, which means this. He's not a guy that's just going to throw shit against the wall and pray that it sticks and call it a story. <laughs> I'm not a journalist, but Jason, I'm more of a talk show host. And right. you've known yes. this your entire life. And I think you and I think you appreciate that I, I don't consider myself a journalist. I'm not. Right. Okay. No, you're 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 here to talk. And I'm an inter, I, I'm more of an entertainer. That's mm -hmm. and, and and I have no problem saying that. This is what Derek Gunn posted. And again, it's got over almost a million and a half views on it now. And this is what has been said. According to sources, Jalen and his big contract pulled in numerous directions on and off the field and under enormous pressure, had issues handling it. Big Dom, the security man, was suspended, controlled Sirianni's emotions on the sideline. And in his absence, Nick had numerous arguments with players and coaches in game and at the back end of the season, that's why it kind of fell and imploded. So they had internal issues and that's one of the more plugged in guys in Philly that covers the team. What's your takeaway on that? Well, I can't confirm or, you know, I don't know. Well, I get it. It's more of an I, opinion. All right. So here's my opinion. on It makes complete and total sense based on the way the team was playing during that stretch you take from the san francisco game on right and i and i thought about this you know i was watching i was like this is a team that doesn't look like i don't want to say it's wrong to say it doesn't belong to leader but is not behind their leader for some various reason okay reasons i should say and you've seen this before when oftentimes you'll see coaches when they sit there and they go, you guys keep screwing up and you're making me look bad. Um, when it's when it's me instead of we, players sniff that out in a hurry. If you start to fight with them on the sideline and blame them, they sniff that out in a hurry, right? Like you, yeah. you pick your... As a coach, you, you can it's pick like your spots. Guilt. Right. You can pick your spots. Sometimes you got to chew somebody's ass, okay? And But it's still about root, right? And the way you the way you do that, like Andy Reid with Kadarius Tony. Yeah. At, at the end of the season, like, it's like, okay, look, I can't play you. I'm not going to get in a fight with you. I'm not going to blame you. I'm not going to throw you under the bus. I'm not say anything bad publicly, but you're just not going to play because because you can't. You've made too many mistakes. I can't have you on the field. Ball players get that. They probably want it to a certain extent, but they don't want you coming out there, you know, you know, crapping all over them, either during the middle of the game or in the press. And, and when you do, I have seen teams flip coaches immediately when they start to do this and that was the feeling i got from the yeah. eagles and this confirms that feeling now i never reported that feeling i just said look this is the team i don't know why they're playing bad but now that you fill in this blank it starts to make more sense with and, and, and jason it's like two different teams so it does make sense and again we're going off of Derek guns reporting and again i'm i'm telling i'm telling jason that he's a respected man in Philly. So here going by that, and I want you to, everyone to know that. And so I'm, accept, I'm accepting point, what you're saying. But to your point, Jace, there they are humming away at 10 and one at the end of the season or one and seven with the playoff game. Well, I mean, it, they, they weren't kind of you know, close they were, to what you're saying. 
Right. Now they weren't playing great all the time during the 10 and 1, but they were still Absolutely winning. They were finding true. way they were finding ways to win. And then ways to win, but these, you know, then this exacerbates it. And the other thing that makes sense about Sirianni is if you watch Sirianni when things are going good, and you know, he's puffing his chest and he's talking trash, and you know, he's he's telling off the officials or and, he's and mugging for Right, and he's mugging for the cameras, right? Like that famous, you know, one that's now a meme, you know, from him from the playoff game where he's mugging for the camera, where I was looking and go, dude, you ain't playing. Just go coach, right? <laughs> right? Like, right? Like, you know, like that, don't do that, right? Um, you get the sense of a guy who wears his emotions on his sleeve, and that can that can be great at times. You know, Jimmy Johnson was a guy who wore his emotions on his sleeve. The good thing about Jimmy is he had players to back it up. Right, and 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 that kind of emotion, we were afraid of that emotion. Right, it's, it's a different kind of thing because he would yeah. he would think nothing about cutting somebody and saying you know you're gone, right? And he had the power to do it. Sirianni doesn't have that kind of he doesn't have that kind of juice. He right, did. he can't walk in. He can't walk in and cut somebody. How he's going to hey. say wait well, wait a second? Hey, Jason, so on the flight back from Washington, after I told you this before, they didn't feed him. Guys were talking, and he goes like this. You shut your effing mouth right now or I'll cut you before the plane lands. Everyone's sitting there going like, he said that? I'm like, yeah, it's that was kind Jim. of oh, that, was Jim. Was. that was Jimmy? Yeah. That was Jimmy? Uh, okay. Yeah. I'll cut yeah. you before this plane lands. <laughs> and he would. He would. Yes. I, yeah. he, he, I, look, I, you know. If you got the power to do it, that's why you know you you do it. I just uh, again to get back to the original point. None of this surprises me. Um, I'm not saying that I know that for a fact that it's true, but it does not surprise me, given the characteristics of the people in play and the way that the team performed for him. This team played like a team that had heard enough from the coach and was tired of the coach's BS um, at that moment. Then he's got to be back. on a short leash next year. Of course he does. Because you can't look, look, you can't lose the locker. Right. You, you guys have to, you have to get guys to play for you, whether you get guys to play for you because they love you, which is the best way to do it, or get guys to play for you because they hate you and they're scared of you, which is the Jimmy Johnson way of doing it. Um, you know, they got to play for you. And if they're not playing for you, then why should I have you as a coach? Right? Like, it's, it's that simple, right? I mean, I, 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 I can't have it. So you got to go. Um, it doesn't matter how good you are in the X's and O's, but the guys have to, the guys have to buy into what you're saying. And one of the things you can't do is consistently throw guys under the bus and rip into them. And I'm not saying, you know, like, People are going to confuse this that, oh, you just have, you know, you're trying to give them a pat on the back and, and be nice to them. All. No, it's that's not it. But you have to treat players like men. You know, you have to walk in and say, look, this is not good enough. And you have to play better. Not you suck as a human being and you're yeah. the reason we're losing. OK, like there's there's a difference there. You can totally. walk up to a guy. You can walk up to a guy and say that ain't good enough. But that ain't good enough doesn't mean you're not a you're a bad person. Jimmy didn't give a shit if you were a good or bad person. He only cared you played. Right. Charles Why Haley wouldn't be on that team if he cared about any of that other BS. He just Absolutely. looked at you and went, hey, I got a production scale here. You give me shit, that scale better have a lot of production on it, or you're right. out of here. <laughs> right. Yeah, you better be on that scale. Play. <laughs> right. And that's and that's how this works, right? That's that's how this always works. The the best players get to get away with the most. Now, hopefully you have players, your best players are not always getting away with a lot of stuff because then they're setting a tone for a bad locker room. But certain guys, Charles Haley was nuts, right? I Holy love Charles God. Haley. I love Charles Haley. Um, Crazy. But but do was you know, if he, oh, yeah, no. if, he, if he was off his meds, right? You know, he'll tell you that. 
Hey, he so, would walk into yeah. a team meeting with no pants on with 45 people in the room and you're all sitting there going, I'm a little uncomfortable. <laughs> a little, little bit. A little bit. Hey, yeah, we're we're, mean, we're yeah. like this. Look, really? Okay. I mean, I, I'm not. Let me go to the other part of that thing. Right. Yeah. The Jalen Hurts not being able to. Boomer Sison said this on our program last year. He said, you know, when you get a contract like that, you got to learn how to play with it. And part of the con part of the comment was is that a lot of players in the room thought that he struggled with the money and a lot of people around him. And I'll tell you this too, Jace, for me, when I got a four hundred thousand dollar signing bonus, that was a lot back in eighty seven for me. And I got that money. I was like this. Hey, you know, I mean, it it it's a, a lot of people around you. It does <laughs> wobble you. So do you give him a pass on that? Because, again, he's a young player, too. And when you deal with that kind of – I'm not saying he was unprofessional. I'm just mm -hmm. saying I think that's an adjustment in your life. You go from this guy to that guy, that's a lot. I, I would want to know a little bit more about what okay. we're talking about. Okay. Before I pass judgment on that. Okay. And I would also say that, look, he just wasn't as good the, as he was the year before, right? Correct. Which I don't know if that's because he couldn't handle the contract or because other teams figured some stuff out. Yeah. Right? Like, yep. I mean, come on, you know, it's like, have you seen Lamar Jackson produce the kind of year that he had statistically that he had in 2019? No. And guess what? Lamar Jackson's probably never going to produce that. No, again. he was better that year than this last MVP year. No, I, I, no, I'm going to disagree with you that, from this. Well, he led the NFL in touchdown passes, 36 I, that year. I, I understand. I understand where we're going. Okay, statistically, you look at it. 2019 is a better year. What I'm saying about Lamar Jackson, and I don't want to get this onto a Lamar Jackson discussion. I think he's a better quarterback. Okay today than he was in 2019 he yes, plays the fair. position better right yep yep and so with with jalen hurts you have that initial first year where you kind of take the league by storm and pe you're doing things that everybody's not expecting they're figuring you out you come back the next year it's like okay we figured you out and we figured out the offense a little bit and you're still good enough to play really well on a 10 and one start <coughs> Excuse me, but the edge between being that and having a one in you know six finish, you know, is, is razor thin. Or, you know, one in five, whatever their finish was, right? It's razor thin. What the what what the difference is, right? And then you get a couple of injuries. You know, AJ Brown's not playing as well. Smith's not, right? You know, Goddard's like some things happen and that are natural progression. And I think that this is part of his growth and maturity as a player. I, th I think that may be a separate issue from the money, but the money may be an issue as well. I just don't know what it means. Like there's a difference between going out and I'm going to spend everywhere. I'm going to be out all night. I'm going to be doing this. I'm going to be doing that. And wow, the pressure is getting to me because I got paid and I got played like an MVP every, every week. Those are, those are two very different kinds of things. And I would want to know more before I pass judgment. Jason, you've been around probably almost all the owners, you know, either mm -hmm. at NFL owners meetings and what have you, interviewing him, whatever. Jeffrey Lurie, what's your takeaway with him as an owner of the Eagles and his place in the league? I mean, do you think he's a good, good owner, great owner? Do you think he – because, again, he's owned a team for going on now 31 years, one championship, I believe it's – one with McNabb, one with Wentz and Foles, and one here this last. So they've got three, three appearances. Super Bowl appearances. Yeah. Okay. Three NFC championships, um, a lot of playoff wins, one title. You know, no one's ever delivered a title since 60 there, obviously. Um, what's your takeaway on him? I think he's a very good, to excellent owner. Um, and and uh, and let me start this. I remember one time, one of the first times I met him. He goes, "Yeah, I remember that interview in Miami you did where you said I didn't know what I was doing uh, because I went <laughs> on radio." <laughs> it's classic. I go, I went on radio, and this was 
early on when they were going through uh, who was one, who was the who was the coach before Andy Reid? Uh, Ray Rhodes. Yeah, were they going through the Ray Rhodes thing? And I just said, you know, the owner doesn't know what he's doing, and you know, it was early on, and he was probably still learning the learning the business quite a bit, and he remembered that, and he said something to me about it, and, and he was. He was not confrontational about it in the, he didn't get in my face about it, but it was like, he was ready to remind me of it, right? You know, when things had turned around. So he's and a scoreboard kind of, guy. Oh, yeah, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with being a scoreboard guy. If you pay attention to the scoreboard, it means that the scoreboard's important to you <laughs> and you're trying to win, right? Like you're trying to win, you're paying attention. And I, and I respect that, you know? Um, as long as it's not like, you know, obnoxious. You get, as long as it's not obnoxious and you want to get your pound of flush, like, you know, I should be I should be held responsible for my opinion too. Like I don't have a problem with that. You know, you want to call me out, go right ahead, because I called you out, right? Um so so he remembers that. And I took it to this means a lot to him. This is not he's not just collecting checks. Now he's collected a lot of checks. He's made a lot of money. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. Um, and you could argue that he's maybe interfered sometimes too much, but I, I think it comes from a place of he wants to win. And the most important thing that you have to have in this league is you have to have an owner who wants to win. And it's important for that person to want to win. Okay. And if you have that, take it. Um, you can probably complain about this or that, or you know, haven't won enough, you know, whatever you want to do, right? But know very deep, deep in your 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 psyche, Jeffrey Lurie wants to win football games. He wants to win championships, and he's going to do everything he can to do that. And here's the other thing: you can't fire the owner. So be happy that you get an owner who. You know, he 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 writes the checks. Okay, be happy that he's like that. Maybe he's not perfect, but I think he's he's in the easily in the upper, you know, five, six, seven owners in terms of trying to trying to get this thing done and do the best you can. He just he doesn't not necessarily have the right mix of players. I mean, you go look over at Clark Hunt in Kansas City, desperately wanting to get this thing right. Hired Andy Reid and got Patrick Mahomes. He's a whole lot better owner now than he was in the in those days before they got Andy Reid. If you go on, go back and look at how things were going in Kansas City early on. He's been a better owner. You could make the argument than his dad. I mean, his, his dad, dad was maybe yeah, more influential in the business of the mm -hmm. NFL. But as and and he won a Super Bowl, got to another one. I get it. They were always playoff teams. They were always competitive. I'm not throwing shade on Lamar. He's an important man in the history of the league. But mm -hmm. I'm saying that you know, I mean, it really comes down to the hiring of the coach, doesn't it, Jason? You get the right guy, then you find a the quarterback. You look magic. like you're the genius. Absolutely, and stay. And the most important thing is get people who know about football and stay out of the way. I've always said the job of the owner is to make the big high level decisions, but leave the day to day tasks to other people. You know, they're the, you know, you don't want, you don't want to be like um, the guy who's coming in and the players are talking to you, telling you how things should be run. No, no, no. You guys look at the players and say, you play for the coach, you know, and that's, and there are a lot of, like, that's what, Jerry Jones does that too much. He gets involved with the players too much. It's one thing to have a nice relationship and pat the guys on the back every once in a while. But you don't want to be talking about football with those guys. You no. don't want to be talking about X's and O's and how do you get along with the coach. You go, you know, like you're the player. You go work with the coach. Yeah. No, I, that, I, that's, I, that's how that that's how that should be. And I think that for the most part, Clark's like that. I think for the most part, um, Jeff Lurie is like that. I think he's had some moments when he's not, um, but there are moments when he's had to make some critical decisions, like getting rid of Chip Kelly. Right? Like he realized his mistake. He brought in Chip Kelly. He thought he was going to get something fantastic, something interesting, and then he found out right away Chip Kelly did not have the mindset to be an NFL head coach. And he may have to make the same decision with Nick Sirianni, which is why he's paying attention. 
He pays attention to the locker room, knows what's going on. But the fact that that in that story, the most disturbing thing to me in that story is that they had to have Dom on the field to to control Maybe Nick. Said. Like this should be a just conversation. Like learn how to talk to your players. Or this learn how to be a pro on the sidelines instead of screaming at the Arizona Cardinals and Colts and Kansas City Chiefs fans and screaming at your coaches and players. I mean, he really is. And I said this, Jace, he may be a good coach. But when you, to me, I like guys like Tony Dungy. They don't get too high, they don't get too low when things mm -hmm. are going good on a team because players look over at that. I can be emotional. I'm a player. My coach can't be. When you're running around like a maniac and you look unprofessional, that makes me believe you're not qualified to be in that position. Well, let me take it. Let me take this another uh, another step further. One of my favorite stories ever um, was it's an, it's an NBA thing. From the first time that the Dallas Mavericks went to the NBA Finals against Miami and they lost, right? And you remember Mark Cuban was on the side, was in the seats right behind his bench, going crazy, screaming at the officials, losing his mind, right? Yep. And what happened? The players started doing the same thing. Because the players are sitting there going, if the owner's doing it, we can do it too. We're going to follow along, right? Because the leader, the whole, the biggest leader in the whole thing, the head of the snake, basically, is acting this way. So the, well, the next time... Like Right. So the next time they get in the finals, I think Avery Johnson was the coach. Avery Johnson went to him and said, Mark, you got to calm down because the players take, take the lead from you. And I got to keep the players focused. I got to keep the players into it, even when the officials make a shitty call. Even when things go bad, I got to keep their minds into it so that we can overcome that. And when you lose your mind, they lose their mind, and I got to get them all back. And it becomes really hard to do that. That's where Sirianni is going to sit there and say, yeah, there's times you want to, you know, be a little bit of a braggart because that's who he is. But you got to reel it in. You got you're you're there to be a teacher. You're there to be a leader. You need to, you need to keep your mind focused. And that's, I think that's a really important lesson. It's got to be a problem solver. When things are sideways, <coughs> to me, yeah. that's the mark of a great coach, Jason, is when, not when things are running great, but when things like Kyle Shanahan has injuries all over his football team, he calms the room down. Or when things aren't going well in Kansas City, and the guys are dropping, you know, Kansas City had the most drops of any team in the league, and they still won the Super Bowl, which is insane. Yeah. They led the NFL in drop passes. But Mahomes and Reed kept going. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Keep hanging in there. Now, well, I mean, and here's, a, well, here's another 15, one. I get it. From from this season, who who are the players who are starting to lose their mind? Mahomes is starting to lose his mind. Kelsey was starting to lose his mind. Right. All these things are happening, and Reed just kind of keeps going. Now, Reed has taken his set of criticisms from some people that early, especially early on in his career, he was too level and that when the games got bigger Andy should have gotten you know should have pushed a little bit harder but that's not his personality but his personality is to ma maintain calm and go we're going to work through this we're going to work through it we're going to work through it and they did a couple of things they hung in there with Valdez Sc Scantling he made two or three big catches in the playoffs and they made a tough decision with Kadarius Tony you know and then enough he's got to sit and we're not going to, you know, and we're not going to engage him when he when he starts screaming and yelling in the playoffs about how he was okay and should have played and wasn't hurt and all this other stuff. We're not engaging him. We're not ripping him. We're not creating a distraction. But we're just going to ignore it and move on. He's not going to play because he's made too many mistakes. Jason, I want to, I want to ask you a question about my friend Seth Joyner. I just had on. Um. Mm -hmm. I wonder how you look at and all your Hall of Fame voters look at this when you're looking at a guy. It has to be a metric that he makes. I don't know if there's a certain amount of Pro Bowls because that metric wobbles year in and year out. So you must, you guys must look at more things at certain positions and certain people. One thing I respect about all you guys, I think there's 50 of you, right, mm -hmm. that vote on that thing. So I say this to you guys. 
So you don't really take one and put everyone in a sandbox and go, he's got to have this metric, this metric, this metric, and this metric. I talked to Derek Brooks about Seth Joyner. And I go, you know, he's one of the only guys with 20 picks and over 30 sacks in NFL history at the linebacker position. And I go, he played with Reggie. And I asked Jared Bell about this. He goes, man, he was on a team with Wes Hopkins and Andre Waters and, you know, with Clyde Simmons and Reggie and Jerome. And, you know, Buddy was his coordinator. It was almost like he made it like he was a product of the environment. And I'm like, Derek Brooks said, hey, he was the first original Tampa 2 type linebacker that could plug a hole, cover a tight end, cover a back, and was a mean hitter. He goes, I was, that was my idol. And I'm sitting there thinking, how do you look at a guy like that that may not have the Pro Bowls needed, but you know that, dude, he's in the conversation with a London Fletcher. He, he's, he was one of the most instrumental guys in one of the greatest defenses in pro football history when you're talking about gang green. How, how do you look at that? Look, I, I think Seth Schweiner was, was a very good, excellent player, right? So and he's possibly, in that room. And he's possibly deserving. This is my initial phase. I haven't studied it, right? And I would say... There's probably an argument that he should be, you know, in the top 25, maybe even in the top 15 some year, depending on the year, depending on the players who are in it, and, and deserves a thorough vetting, right? He's a little bit far down the line at this point yep. in time. Yep. And so that may, that time may have passed. And I, I've been a voter for 11 years, so I don't know if, you know, where I am on that responsibility list. Um, but probably should think about him a little bit more at the same time i haven't had a lot of people come up to me and say god you guys are really missing it on seth Joyner. you guys you know this guy should really be in the room he should be discussed he should you know be talked about um and maybe i just haven't heard that conversation maybe it doesn't exist so right now it's like okay I'll go do some reading and I'll do some research on, on, on Seth Joyner. I'm not sure he's, I'm not sure there's enough time to get him through that process. No, no, no. I would, I would say this to you. So there's gotta be a ton of people then like Dennis Hara that, well, that just fell through the seven time pro bowler. Every year he played, he was on one of the one or two and he's a friend of mine, obviously a hurricane. And he, he, um, he played with those Rams teams, and he had Slater next to him, of course. And here's mm -hmm. a seven-time Pro Bowler who never played on an offensive rushing attack with Dickerson that was never out of the top three in rushing. And how is a guy like that, who's a seven-time Pro Bowler, overlooked with some of the guys that are getting into the Pro Football Hall of Fame? I mean, no disrespect to some guys, man. The kid from Pittsburgh going in a couple of years ago, and you look at a guy who was a seven-time. You're Bowl. talking about Fanica? Yeah. And I'm like, Alan Fanica's better than Dennis Hara? I don't think so. Look, uh, Dennis Hara's, you know, I wasn't covering all when Dennis Hara, Dennis Hara played. He was on what was then my favorite team. You know, I was a Rams fan growing up. That died when they left Southern. That John Robinson team? Yeah, I love that John Robinson. I love that. I go back to, you know, I go back to ground Chuck with Chuck Knox, right? Yeah. You know, I remember Ray, Ray Malavese and Vince Ferragamo, right? I was in high school at that time. So I, I, I know the Rams pretty well. You know, Jack Youngblood, like, yep. that's John, that's John Wayne of football, right? Like, <laughs> right. He's a gator, but I love him. He's a, but, he's a, <laughs> but you know he's a badass, right? Oh, badass. He and now, been, he now that they've done that 1960 add into the sacks, he's fifth all time. Right. And if he had been, and if he had been a cane, he would have been a great cane. <laughs> he would have, he would have fit He's right gator, in with, <laughs> him, with Ted, him and Ted Hendricks. Um, oh wow! Could you, could you imagine those two guys together? Oh my God, they uh, played at around the same time too, which is I crazy. Know. Yeah, those those two were nuts. But yeah, I mean, what, what I, I guess what I'm saying is like there are guys who fall in the, fall through the cracks. Man, it's a, it's a tough deal, man. I'm not, I'm not. This is not easy, which is why the which is why the senior pro process exists and why, you know, I'm not, 
I'm not a fan of the senior process because sometimes I think we bring up too many guys. It changes history. Right. But, but I'm at the same time, I'm like, it, it serves a purpose. There are some guys who get overlooked and they, you know, they deserve another chance. And I know that it becomes a long shot chance, but they deserve another chance. And so I'm, you know, as much as I'm, as much as I'm critical of it, I'm not saying do away. I would never say do away with it. And so a guy like a Dennis Harris, a guy like a Seth Joyner, you've got to have outlets for those guys. We should be discussing a lot of guys in that room and considering it. I mean, I was happy. I know Art Powell did not get in this year, but I think it was a it was good that Art Powell was discussed. Right? I think it was important that Al, Art Powell was discussed. You I think Marvin Buddy Powell Par um you think Marvin Powell deserves consideration? Head of the union at one time. Um, Plate was a six-time Pro Bowler. I don't know Marvin's. I know the name. I don't know. Okay. I don't know right. all. I don't know enough of the history to. Hey, to there's say so many word. great ones, you know. Yeah, it, it, this is what it is. I will also say this. <clears throat> there's a there's a little, and I and the Pro Bowl doesn't mean as much because like so many guys now. Well, today it, it doesn't. Then it did maybe. It did, but it did. And at the same time, the way that we analyze players is more sophisticated today than it was then. Oh. The great the grading of players, the examination of players, the the discussion of players is much deeper than it is today than it was then. The league's bigger. You know, we're 32 teams. We're talking yep. you were talking about a league that was 26. Yeah, 26 you know, at the time. Right. Right. So so there's some growth there. And and so while I while I agree Dennis Hare was a great player and part of a great offensive line, a really great Tom Newberry, um, was it Rich Saul on that line? Yeah, Rich Saul about. was on that team. I played against yeah. that old line. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a really great, you know, typical John Robinson. The year, get you this, were, the year that Dickerson left, to show you how great that line was, Char Charles White, who never really had a great NFL career. He becomes the back for Dickerson when Dickerson went to Indianapolis. Yeah. He had thirteen hundred yards that year. I don't know. He was really good. he was a really good player. Charles White was a real not a great player, really good player. But, but when you're behind line, a line like that, you're going yeah. places. Yeah, I mean, and and when you're basically going, we're just going to maul you. Like shit, Tom Newberry. Because, what a great guard. Yeah, I mean, there's well, I thought Newberry was the center. Maybe I'm remembering. Oh he, no, 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 Saul was the center. So Newberry I was the center. Was Newberry the was the right guard. Yep. Who was our, I can't the right tackle was a good another good player. Oh, he but. was another good one. I can't remember him, but I get this. Here on my side, when the Bucks went to Anaheim, we're playing at the big A. They had been booted out of the Coliseum for some reason. I think the Raiders no, were no, they, they left on they left on their own. Oh, they okay. The so we're playing at the big point. A. Yeah. We're, we're yeah. playing at the big A. I've got Jackie Slater, who's a dear friend today. And of course, Dennis. Dennis goes, "Hey, man, what's up?" And I'm like, "These guys were like this. They were big." Dennis is six six, and 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 Jackie, I got a great picture with he and my wife. We're great friends, and he's like six six. The thing was enormous, man. Oh, they These were guys they were, were gargantuan. They were a they were a USC line, you know the the old because USC of John line. Robinson. That's a great call. Robinson. You're right. We're just coming. We're just coming in, and we're coming in with six foot five, six foot six guys. That it's the old um, Parcells was like this too, but John Robinson was like this. Um, have the all the have all those guys line up and to be the first ones to walk off the bus, like in high school. Remember in high school, like the you, the, the bus would pull up and make sure all the biggest guys got off first. Because hey, hey, like, uh, they didn't weigh those guys on normal scales; they were Toledo's. <laughs> yeah, uh, they were just—they were big men, and they just—and and they were road grading. Oh God! They were road grading at a time when it was, you know, road grading was hard. Like oh. they could road grade people then. Today, road grading is not as hard because of the way you have to play defense and how and how you have to be lighter on defense so much. It's you still can't do it because people just aren't going to run downhill all the time, but. But the, the to be able to road grade uh, on blocks and just slobber knock people all the time, mm. 
is just a testimony to how great they were. So yeah, I mean, it's personally, I would love to have Dennis Harris discussed in the room. I was a, I was a fan Kuchenberg of Dennis. Kuchenberg isn't. Kuchenberg just he couldn't get enough support. You know, he had, I've never been in there when Kuchenberg's name came up. And is that Armando? Know, no, that was that was that was Pope. That was okay. Edwin Pope. Edwin Pope was the guy. Um, and Edwin's, you know, we've lost both Cooch and. Oh and yes, Pope. I'm an Edwin Pope guy. He loved me. Yeah, ab absolutely. But you know, even Edwin couldn't get quite enough. And I think the problem with Kuchenberg is there were already too many guys off that '72 team who had gotten in. Like the I fact never respect, matter, I never respected that that that. Well, you know, yeah. I'm not. I, I'm not guys. saying. I'm not saying it's a good argument. I'm just saying oh. that it happens. Yes. Okay. You're right. People get. People, they you know, said that like, about oh, got, the Steelers. Right. Well, it's like, okay, we got Larry Little in. We got, um, we got, you know, Jim the Langer. In, in. We got Gre Greasy in. We got Zonka in. We got um, the centers Warfield in. in. Yeah. Right. Um, like we got all these guys in. Like, in. Look here. Let me just say this, because I I sometimes wonder about it myself. There's like 13 guys who are members of the Packers in the mix, mid 60s who are in. 13. Out okay. of 22. Wow. No, not out of 22. Out of, out of, you know, just make it 40. You know, like. No, out of 22 get, starters. 22 starters, a 40 man roster, right? And yep. I know that the roster's changed a little bit, yep, yep, but it's yep. still a 40 man roster. And so you're telling me that 13 guys. 13 belong in the Hall of Fame from I mean I know they were great but 13 you think the mystique of Lombardi got most of those guys in I, well, the mystique of the Packers you know and it's I, it, so like Jim Ringo you would question I I, I the guard who was the guard who just got in who Kramer. was yeah Jerry Kramer I was like really like another one? And and I'm not saying I look, I was a baby still when that team was winning titles. So the entire backfield's in. Right. Like you know, like quarterback, the two backs are in the Hall of Fame. Three offensive linemen, you know, David Robinson, you know, like just Forrest there's Greg. a ton of guys. Forrest Greg, like it's just a ton of guys. And I'm like, wait a sec, 13 guys were Hall of Famers. They did, they, did win, like, they win, did win five titles in nine years, and they're the last team to go three yeah, in but, a row. Right. I understand that. But like they didn't go undefeated for five years. No. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Like I, there's, oh. there's a certain point at which like you start to say, and, and I'm a big believer in winning, don't get me wrong. But it was a 14 team league. 14 teams. I'm so you're 40. saying the sports riders had a lot to do, depending on what. What city I'm saying is, this, the, the league had about the league had about 600 players at the time, right? Right. It's not that big a league today. The league has close to 2,000 players. But you're saying to me that 13 of them, uh, when the league was 600 players, there's 13 guys on one team. Like this is where I start to go. This is where I start to question the senior process and start to say, hey, wait a second. Like, like, you know, like, yeah, there were a lot of great players in the past, but the standard, you know, what's the standard? Because there's a lot of great players now who would, I'd argue, were every bit as good, if not better, than those other guys who played in the past. Right? And now, oh, yeah. uh, some, uh, some of that is... Carol do you think Carol Carmichael's a, a Hall of Famer? No. I wasn't on that committee. No. Yeah. He's in. Congratulations. He's a gold jacket. I would never disrespect him, but I wouldn't have voted for him. And let me just say this. I grew up watching Harold Carmichael. I loved Harold Carmichael. I loved to watch, you know, like you would sit there and go, let me. How do you how do you make that move? And you go out in the and you go out on the street and you go, okay, let me see if I can make this kind of move. And then you realize I'm not six foot seven, right? Yeah, right. I can't do this, right? 
and I'd like, and or I'd pretend, you know, for a mi- for a half a second that I was Harold Jackson running under a pass from James Harris, right? Or, you know, Drew Pearson, right? But you're telling me that Drew Pearson and Harold Carmichael are Hall of Famers, and I'm like, Heinz Ward may never get a shot. Right, thirteen. And you're telling, I'm telling, I'm telling you right now. I think. Okay, Klein's I see worth- how. No, no, I see how you look at it. And to, for the record, in '66, the roster was 36. Even, even, even better. That my point is that you're now you're talking about 13 out of 36, right? We're Hall 13 of 13 guys are Hall of Famers. A third of the guys on the team were all a third of the roster was Hall of Famers. And by the way, if you remember right, the year before in 59, they won one game. I just I and I and I'm trying to take shots at the Packers because they're a historic team, they're important. But I just I I I I fight against the is this really better players or are we talking about mystique? Is this really better players or are we talking about people's childhoods you know where they held reverence for these guys like when i look at drew pearson i was like tony hill was better right and not because he went to stanford but because tony hill was better you know in a lot of those years right and drew pearson i just go hall of fame drew pearson really (laughs) i I just Really? You better watch out, Cowboy fans. <laughs> I said, hey, look, I forget. And but he's in. You know, I, I'm only one guy, I'm only one guy, but I just sit there and go, what are if we're doing that? Look, Harold Jackson was a really great player. If you go look at the stats and look at the numbers, you think you they go should go the away with the um, veterans committee? Well, I'm just saying, if you put Drew Pearson in the Hall of Fame, when do I get to make an, a discussion for Harold Jackson? And let me just say this: I love Harold Jackson. I was a Rams fan growing up. He's not a Hall of Famer, but he's a Hall of Fame player. He's not a Harold Jackson is not a Hall of Fame player, but if Drew Pearson is, that's what, what I'm is saying. Different? What's the difference between Harold Jackson no. and Drew Pearson? No. Drew Pearson played for the Cowboys. He won championships. He had titles. So that is the difference, and I respect that, and I and I give it to Drew Pearson. But I watched them both play, and I may not be an expert, but I can tell you this: Harold Jackson was every bit as good as Drew Pearson as a player. You may not be an expert, but you are a voter, and it matters. And, Jason, I love talking with you. Thank you so much for your national perspective on this. Oh, I want to leave you with one more. Okay. Mike Evans, do you think it's a real thing that the Kansas City Chiefs are going to go heavy in on him? There's a conversation yeah. going. The only reason that it wouldn't – they said how much and to what degree will they have to go to to try to go, yeah. but – Mike Evans going to Kansas City. Do you think it's a thing? I think it's absolutely a thing because I know that Brett Veach has said privately because he wouldn't say it publicly because he would have been throwing his guys under the bus. But he has privately said, I'm not going to do this to my quarterback again. I'm not going to overestimate what I have at wide receiver. Good night. Mike right. Evans in Kansas City. <laughs> but let me just say this. They, they should do two things. They should go get Mike Evans. Or a vet or a veteran receiver like Mike Evans. And he doesn't have to be as good as Mike Evans. He can be um Jeremy Smith or Jojo. Who am I thinking of? Smith Smith Schuster. The kid yes, that they I, have. I, yeah. yeah. Juju Smith Schuster. Juju Smith Schuster. Went to New England. Too. Yeah. It can be a guy like that who just again, what does he do? He runs the right routes, he's in the right place, he catches the ball. That's all they needed. They would have won three more games this year, and we wouldn't have been calling this some magical mystery ride if they just caught the ball, right, during the regular season. They would have won three more games. And so get guys who are competent, get at least one more guy who's competent who catches the ball. Mike Evans would be really nice because he's a little bit more than just competent. He's a very good player. But I would get Evans, and then I would come back and I would draft one in this draft because you're deep. 
And I would even try and move up and maybe get from one of the kids from Washington. You don't yep. have to get the number one kid. But you can get the, yeah, but you can get the other kid. You know, yep. I mean, they had some, they had three guys. He's a top play, thirty-two right? guy, right? So I'm going to go get two more guys because at least I'll have one vet who I'm not going to have to worry about. And while that guy is still on my team, I'm developing the other young guy, and that way I can leave Rasheed Rice to be the underneath guy and be the number three, right? And now I'm all of a sudden I'm taking even more pressure off of Kelsey in the middle. And I, maybe I can stretch out Kelsey for not just one or two. You know, maybe I can stretch out Kelsey for two, three more years because I'm not asking so much. Jason, I, I, I just got this confirmed, and I just saw some of my friends are saying it too. And I want, I want to preface this before you answer it. You know, being around in San Diego, I got a chance to know the Aztec football program, the athletic director, J.D. Wicker, I knew the prosecutor, I knew the lawyer, and I talked to everyone on Matarism. And Matarism was vindicated. All those charges, and now he's been signed by the Chiefs. Yep. Here's a guy that averaged 52 yards a punt in college, and when he was up in Buffalo, all they could just rave about, well, what if game changer, almost like the conversations you used to have in a day about Ray Guy, What's your mm -hmm. takeaway on the chief signing a guy with – how about this? Perception issues because some are still not going to look at it even though – because we know how society is today. Well, look, he, was, he, wasn't th he wasn't there. That's been confirmed. Right. Okay. Wasn't he there. Wasn't, he wasn't there. That doesn't mean – that's not to say that he's like a super good guy. No, no. But he, I don't know anything about the guy. I don't know if he is a good guy or not a good guy. I'm not going to vouch for the guy. Neither am I. Really. But, but here's the bottom line. He wasn't there. Right. It's as simple as that. So he should have a chance to further his career. If he wasn't there and he's not guilty of what he was accused of, he's, you know, like he should get a chance to play. Did it need to be an organization like the Chiefs with the Hunt family, with – Andy Reid, did it need to be somebody like that that has a Brett Veach in the building and all that leadership in the building to bring a yeah. guy like that in that could withstand the negativity that the organization may take with some outlier people? I mean, it, it, look, it helps because they've got a cache. You know, they can cash some chips right now, right? Yeah. And sit, and sit there and say, look, you know, we just won a Super Bowl. We, we, we do a good job of trying to, you know, take get the right people in here and do the best we can, right? Um, but it's a careful balance, and I'm sure there are going to be people who are upset about it, and and you know, maybe rightfully so, because somewhere along the line, let's just say this with a really, he's not guilty of anything, but he got himself involved in something that is certainly untoward, right? Like yes, he was. It's like you know, if I was the kid's dad, I'd like, what were you doing there? Yeah, no. I, yeah. What what was what was going on? You know, like what happened? What happened that you were in any way involved? Now, maybe it is that she was just you know looking for a payoff, and she included him in the lawsuit, and then that's not his fault. But maybe it's like you know you got bad friends, you got bad you got bad people around you who do bad things. Oh, you're you you're talking not... more about decision making, like your decision. Right, you're talking about issues, decision. right? Hey, hey, look that that is part that is all part of it, uh, you know. And and who do you surround yourself with if you want to be successful? You know, because those people who are around you are going to influence you uh, influence a lot of your decisions. Some of those people you got to kick to the curb, or you got to keep them at a certain distance. You know, those are the people who undermined Michael Vick's career. He wasn't strong enough to kick people out of his life who were going to get into trouble. He went along with it, right? That that undermined his career. Okay, that doesn't. He's responsible for that, but you know they played their part. Okay, you got to make better decisions. You know along the way, and somewhere along the way, Arisa is like, look, I got a career, I got a life, I got I got to walk away from this, and walk away from you guys. <clears throat> if you're going to get me involved in things that are that are you know that can hurt me, or if you know that we're friends. And I was at this party. 
don't be doing stuff like this. Don't, you know, like, don't get me in it. And, and I know that I'm asking, you know, I'm, I'm playing a lot of hypotheticals out here. And the kid's in the league, and he's going to get his chance, and he deserves another chance to play. That's absolute. But question the people that you're around you if you want to have this kind of career. You can support them. You can send them money. Yeah, it's like this. Guys talk about, well, that's my family. Those are my friends. Those are the people who raised me. Good. Send them, send them a check for five grand. Hey, hey, man, if that guy's hurt my anything, I'll see you later, guy. That's not how I run. Well, I, mean, I, I remember talking to Plaxico, uh, when I read Plaxico Burris' book, right? And he was talking about, you know, he had like four or five of his buddies from, from down in Newport News living in his house. And he goes, yeah, a couple of guys, they stole this, they stole that, they took checks out of my checkbook, they got into trouble around town. And he goes, he came in one day, he goes, you all are out of here. You're all out, gone, gonzo. He goes, it's making my life too complicated. This is a wreck, you're all out, okay? I know another player, They were the team was about to give him a gigantic contract. He had three or four of his boys living at the house. Team said, We'll give you this contract, but the boys got to go. And he walked in that day. He went down. He said, you're all out. Okay? Because they don't want trouble. I don't need your 25-year-old hanger-on buddy from college hanging at the house. He's going right to do something stupid. He's going to do something stupid. Okay? Right on, my friend. Another great conversation, as always. Thank you so much for everything you do for me, man. You're always there for me, and I thank you so much. And keep doing what you do. Thank you so much, Jace. I will see you, dude. Be good. You got it. Our good friend, Jason Cole. We so look forward to him each and every single week. Please hit the like button. Keep it here, National Football Show.